Welcome to SCI TV. We have a big group here today. With us, we have Ken Pendleton. Ken, why don't you say hello? Hi. We have Avery Ingram. Avery, why don't you say hello? Hello. We have Brandon Ingram. Brandon, you're, you're hello. Live. And we have Terry Hi. And Today, what we're talking about is an issue that we're dealing with around happy inclusion. I'm going to turn it over to Ken Pendleton, who's going to moderate, and we'll go from there. Ben. Hi, everyone. I want to start by essentially having the Ingram family tell the story. And so, Avery, I first want to let everybody know that you're blind, and yet you decided to become a high school wrestler. Can you walk us through that and tell us why you wanted to do something that sounds so difficult on the surface? Yeah, so basically, I think I got into wrestling because I read a book about another blind wrestler, and it made me realize that wrestling was a sport that I could actually do. So I, I thought it was really cool. And what were your goals? Well, at first I just wanted to do a sport, like, um, you know, because I couldn't play, like, basketball or anything like that. So it was just cool to play a sport. Yeah. So and, and did you find it at first this was a really positive experience? Yeah, definitely. In, in what ways? Well, basically, uh, I just think that it really um, – Well, it's really shown me that, you know, there are a lot of things I can do, and even if it might be really difficult, I can still do it. So. Well, that, well, that sounds really valuable. Um, Teresita, how did this affect your, his, your, his siblings, your family, your friends, people around you react to this idea? Um, it was a little bit of an adjustment for our family at first. Um, we ended up going to wrestling practice um, before school and after school. And his um, older brother ended up being at school so much with us during wrestling practice that he decided halfway through the season to join. And so he became a wrestler because of Avery. And then when Avery graduated from high school, he... Um, uh, we he was still involved with wrestling, and so his younger brother, who was two years younger than him, decided to get into wrestling because of the fact that his older brother was into wrestling. So Avery always had a brother on the team with him, um, and they ended up being his workout partners, um, mostly because the other coaches didn't really uh, know who to pair Avery with um, or how to deal with blind wrestler, I would say. And so um, his brothers obviously knew how to communicate with Avery and interact with him and uh, be able to verbally describe moves to um, which can be difficult for other people that are not used to that. Um, so it, it, it was a lot for our family, but it was we turned into a positive thing. Um, I would say how it affected his uh, community around him was that um, people who watched Avery, whether Avery was winning or losing, they were really um, affected by Avery in, in a positive way. And I, I say that because we would um, be watching Avery during uh, a match, and all of a sudden we would realize that the whole entire um, Jim was cheering for Avery, and if Avery, if Avery won the match, you know, it was really, really loud um, with all the cheers, and that was pretty awesome. Um, but even when he didn't win the match, he got a lot of applause, and he got a lot of high fives and pats on the back, and, you know, good job, and, you know, you're my hero kind of um, comments, um, and that was very cool, and, um, uh, another example that I wanted to share with everyone was um, a, a way that it personally impacted a, uh, another wrestler that Avery was wrestling. Um, when Avery was a sophomore, he wrestled um, at, a, at a tournament in Grants Pass, and we hadn't been to this tournament before. And so he was wrestling for the JV, and he ended up going to... Um, 
a match and there was a, a boy there and they started wrestling in, during the first period. Um, during that first period, um, you know, Avery got a, hurt just a little bit, but, he, you know, he's tough and so he just wrestled on through. And about halfway through that period, um, I noticed that the other boy started crying and I thought, oh no, did Avery hurt him? Is he going to be okay? And the end of the first period came, and the boy's crying still. And I thought they might, you know, take a take a little bit of time out, but they didn't. Um, they started the second period, and the boy is still crying. And um, and it's kind of like a very uh, like a heartfelt sobbing at, at this point. And I uh, turned to the man that I was standing next to, and he happened to be a coach of another team. And he says um, to me that that boy must be going through a lot of emotions right now. And um, I said, well, is he crying because he's hurt? And he said, no. So um, I look over to the, the coach next to me, and he's, um, he's just telling me that he believes that this boy is crying because he's just realizing that the wrestler that he is wrestling against is blind and that it's really affecting him, and he proceeds to tell me that um, he actually sees this type of reaction a lot, that when somebody is wrestling um, somebody with a disability, particularly a blind athlete, that it puts them in a position to um, think about their own abilities and realize that the person that they are wrestling against doesn't have those same abilities, but they're still wrestling with all of their heart. Um, so that actually, his comment to me made me um, start crying. I had to, I had to just basically run out of the gym because I didn't want anyone to see me cry, and I was just almost uncontrollable so sobbing. And so, um, you know, of course, I I try to get it together um, in time to come back to watch the rest of the match. And so I um, get back into the gym by the time the match is over. Um, the boy has been crying this whole entire time. Um, Avery was wrestling against him. He, so the other boy was not able to pin rest, uh, Avery for the whole wrestling match. Um, but uh, the other boy ended up winning by points. And um, like I said, he wasn't able to pin Avery. Um, and even though he won, he, he, you know, he was still uh, very emotional. He ended up. Um, having his arm raised by the ref, and in that same moment, you know, went to hug Avery and kind of cry all over him a little bit. And so the the match ends, and um, Avery went back over to um, the rest of his team, and uh, and I went up to Avery and I said, you know, do you know what just happened? And he said, so. Avery didn't really understand what had happened the whole time. He kind of thought that he had hurt the other wrestler. And um, I kind of explained to him that that boy was actually just pretty moved by him as a wrestler. And Avery still didn't understand it. He didn't get it. Um, but we went and uh, he wanted to talk to the other wrestler and make sure he was okay. So we found him and um, he was, you know, he was trying to get it together at that point and he ended up just um, telling Avery that he had a lot of respect for him and um, that um, that he was honored to wrestle against him. And so ever since that match, um, for the rest of that match and any other uh, meets that we go to, um, actually whenever we're there with that wrestler, he ends up going and sitting and watching Avery's matches and um, just being a big supporter, and that's pretty. That's pretty awesome. And in my opinion, that's um, it's just very powerful, and it shows um, the the emotion and um, the value in having a um, a teammate on a wrestling team who has different abilities than everyone else. Brandon, can you add from your perspective a bit about what was going on for you as a parent to you know, one experience the highs and lows of, of having Avery do some of the wrestling, and then you know, and Avery, we want to bring you back into the conversation as well. Yeah, I, I guess in the beginning, um, you know, I, I, well, first of all, I never thought about Avery as a wrestler. Um, I'm really happy he read this book and was motivated by it. Um, 
it was great for me as a father, um, especially having two other boys who are active in sports. It was great to see Avery participate as well. I think it made him feel good about himself. Really built his confidence. Um, uh, I guess it, seeing him um, put so much heart in drive. I guess it's kind of the same kind of drive I had when I was younger. I was um, just just very I don't know very uh, I don't know very uh, I'm sorry. I just uh, I was just very proud of him the whole time. Um, when Avery. Um, did decide to join the team. Um, I was I was pretty surprised on how um, excited the other uh, I guess the other wrestlers were to have him in there. Um, his brothers were, were also like Teresa said, very motivated by it. So eventually they ended up joining the team because of Avery, and uh, I guess because of his accomplishments and his drive. Um, I think they also saw a change in Avery. It made him a lot more confident, and I think they thought that they could benefit from that as well in the same way. Um, Avery did work really hard. It was new to him, um, the whole thing. He had never seen wrestling, of course, so he did a lot of uh, research on it, read a lot of the books, a lot of stuff online, um, which helped him really, uh, I guess, advance faster than a lot of people could have. Um, he he struggled the first year. Um, you know, he had won no matches the first year, but it, it didn't stop him. He was still. He remained very positive, and uh, I guess he he reevaluated himself in the first year. In the second year, he started winning matches. He he. I think he won maybe a quarter of his matches the second year, and by his third year, he had. I think he had won over half of his matches. Some of them were even varsity, I believe. Um, and is it, Brandon? He, is it? Yes. Is it right too that I mean it sounds like in some ways he's picking up the sport a little later than maybe some of his teammates were and, and other folks. Is, is that is that right from my understanding of wrestling? Yeah, you're, you're correct, um, and that that is the reason why he spent so much of his off time researching um, wrestling is because he was he did feel he was behind. We felt he was as well. Um, it's, it's it was really because of. The lack of, uh, I guess, the lack of one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, you know, it's it's for the coach. You know, it's vis it's visually, you know, it's it's visually teaching, and everyone can see. But Avery, so when the when the moves are demonstrated, Avery did his best to listen, but he couldn't really see what was being demonstrated. So, um, once we saw that this was an issue, um, and his brother saw that as well, I think that's why his older brother ended up joining the team. One of the reasons because he felt that Avery really needed someone there to demonstrate the moves. Once that happened, it, it really helped Avery a lot. Unfortunately, um, while the other kids were actually practicing the moves for their three or four minutes, that's when our oldest son was actually demonstrating them to Avery. So instead of Avery needing to actually practice the moves or his brother getting to practice the moves, they were, he was still learning it. This actually went on for four years. Um, so he really didn't get the practice time most people did. And he was getting instruction from a brother who was still learning to move himself, who was trying to figure it out. So a lot of times he really didn't learn it the way he should have learned it. Um, but because of Avery's, you know, his drive, he did practice, you know, all year round. Every off season, no matter what, he was always at practice. Before practice, he was hungry for it, and he, you know, kept a positive attitude through the whole thing. Uh, Brandon, this sounds like it should have been a positive story. What went wrong? Uh, I think I think the biggest thing is uh, you know the fact that Avery couldn't see the the, the coach. Um, this is a, was the first experience for him. It was the first you know in wrestling at least. It, it was the first experience for the school. I know there are other visually impaired athletes and swimming and so on, but this was the first that I know of for wrestling. So I I really believe that uh, you know. It, I was very upset at the coach. I was very upset at the athletic director. But then again, you know, was it their fault? You know, um, I just I felt like I felt like there should have been someone there to at least supervise in the game to see what was going on, to make sure that he was a fit for this program. I guess to see if it was even safe for him to do it. You know, he basically said, "I'm going to wrestle," and he wrestled. You know, it was 
it was really up to him, you know, and I, I just felt that maybe there should have been someone there to give him a little bit of guidance like there was for his, you know, his normal education. Um, but it never happened. So I just felt like he was kind of left behind, you know, the whole time. And, you know, I, like um, a lot of kids got to go to districts. His first year he didn't go. We understood that. You know, he didn't win any matches his second year. He didn't win any. He won a few matches, still didn't go. We kind of understood that because he was still a young wrestler. Um, but the third year, he wasn't allowed to go, and that really bothered us. Um, and, the, and the fact that Avery was actually told by his coach, and the coach also told my wife, that Avery worked so hard that he deserved to go and he was going to go to districts. You know, Avery went to districts, he weighed in. At the last second, he finds out that he's on the list to wrestle, and the coach says, you know, I never really said you could, you know, wrestle. I brought you, I thought you deserved to come watch. And that was very, very tough on all of us. Um, you know, we had people on Facebook. Everyone was excited, asking how we did. Um, so I, I was pretty upset. I was vocal about it. I told the coaches, all of them, how upset I was, and that you know Avery deserved to go. And um, there was a kind of a rumor going around that our youngest son was no longer going to wrestle there. Um, he was going to go to a different school because of the way Avery was treated. It just hurt him a lot. So basically, our once that was heard, the, the coaches promised me that Avery would finally go to District 16 or year. They were not going to let this happen to him again. It was a, it was a promise. And by one of the assistant coaches, he had talked to our head coach. And we go down to Grants Pass for, for districts, and Avery's warming up in front of his coaches. He weighs in. Everything's fine. Um, they call his weight class. I go down with Avery, and they tell me Avery's disqualified from the district. Well, he didn't say he disqualified. He said he was not on the list. So me, Avery, and the, and the assistant coach found the head coach, and the head coach told us at that point that Avery was disqualified from the tournament because the head coach had put him in the wrong, a lower weight class, which we found out later that it was basically to give him an advantage because the coach really wanted to make sure he could compete. Um, so that... I can't explain the anger I had, how hurt I was, how hurt Avery was, um, my wife... Other parents in the stands were crying. Um, it was, it was, it was a terrible experience. So, so Avery, what we were hoping is you could bring us to where you were at when you learned that you were not going to be able to wrestle in districts. What was that, what was that news like to hear? So, I was really disappointed just because, you know, pretty much everyone wrestles at districts. Even at even when they're freshmen at some schools, but you know, even all four years, I never got to wrestle, so it was kind of disappointing. And, and did you have any more wrestling after that? No, um, I did go to the practices just because I did want to keep wrestling, but there weren't any more matches or anything like that. So. And then, Teresita, from your perspective, too, as, as Avery's mom, can you tell us a little bit about what that whole experience was like for you before we shift into some of what we want to do about it? Can you repeat that? Sure, just asking if you could give us a little of your perspective on being in that moment when you found out Avery wasn't able to participate in, in districts. Oh, that was pretty devastating for me. Um, I actually just um, ended up crying, and I'm going to cry right now because uh, it still really hurts. Um, I remember sitting there and just thinking that um, I was never going to get to watch my son wrestle at districts, and it was, it was, um, it was a horrible feeling, actually. And I think something that was... Um, even worse is that our other son is, is wrestling at districts for his first time, and I couldn't even enjoy that because I was just sitting there and crying, and I couldn't stop crying, and I cried for about two hours off and on, and then finally, um, when the day was done, uh, we had originally planned to spend the night there, and um, all of us, we we just thought, what are we doing here? We can't. We, 
we just don't want to be here anymore. And it was also sad because I, you know, we had been very involved as parents with the whole organization. Basically, what she was saying is we had done a lot for the program as parents, as volunteers. Um, not only do we go to fundraisers, but help to organize them. Our kids were all of them. Um, sometimes we even had our cousins from another school come and volunteer. Um, my wife joined the boosters to help out. Um, you know, becoming the president of the boosters to help the program because the program was suffering. It's so small. It is a football school, so that's a lot of the money goes and a lot of the effort from my parents. Um, I even ran a snack bar at the first volumes to get credit, you know, have money go towards the program. Um, we, give, we give a lot. Um, you know, we had a huge barbecue at the final wrestling match in Sheldon. I had all ten parents from other high schools that are volunteering. Like I went and got food donated from, from Albertsons and different people so we could make money for the program. We, we, we kept our end of the bargain. We did everything and then some because well, for our kids, for the program itself, we wanted to see it be a success in the future after our kids were gone. Um, so, you know, what Teresa is saying is, well, it was a slap in the face. You know, we put out a lot of effort, um, and more than the other parents, sometimes other parents, none of them would show up to the meets. It was just us. So it just, we just, we could never understand it. We tried to put ourselves in the shoes of, of the coaches, and just, it didn't make sense to us. You know, we were, we were very confused and left very hurt. So j just to kind of recap a little bit for, for a moment here. So it sounds like what what happened really was that here you had Avery who discovered this sport that he didn't know he would have interest in and really found out he loved it and, it, and, and really immersed himself in it, read books, participated, became a family event. Um, and then you guys uh, really had this horrible ending to his high school wrestling career. And, and so someone who's been – spending his time inspiring everyone with his athletic accomplishments and, and his effort, um, suddenly is left on the outside looking in and not able to, to participate. And, and so then here you are left at that moment trying to figure out what to do as a family. What, what, what's sort of your thought process at that point? Like what, what are your options that you're playing around with when you know that this, this career has been cut short? And, and while well, I start with you, Brandon, then we can – Turn to you, Teresita, and, and also to you, Avery. You know, I was, uh, we were all so hurt, but I'll speak for myself. Right at, at the meet itself, I had talked to a couple of parents who were very upset, and we were all in agreement that we were going to go straight to the school. And I just, I wanted basically to have the coach fired. I was so upset. I, I thought that was my only option at the time, and that would give me satisfaction. And that was my plan for a long time, and I just, Kept biting my tongue, you know, waiting, hoping that something would hit me and give me the give me the right the correct answer because I knew revenge wasn't going to do anything, and I knew it, you know, it's it, if he was fired, it would be an ongoing problem. It would be the next coach and the next coach until someone was educated on, you know, the rights of someone who's visually impaired. I guess um, now I'm looking at it as you know what this did end badly for us, but for us to have closure and to have great, I guess a great memory of, of what Avery did is to see change happen because of what he went through. So now I'm um, working you know, with people like you and getting ideas from friends. Um, I think we're coming up with some great ideas, you know, how to educate maybe not only this school district, but other school districts, maybe even nationally, on um, of making people aware of, of this situation, that, that there are a lot of people like Avery out there who are not participating on the level they, they should be allowed to. Yeah, and, and, and certainly that, that's not, you know, everyone's reaction in these situations. I think your reaction about wanting to see a coach fired and have someone pay for this is probably a very normal reaction that we see in these situations a lot. Uh, how about you, Teresita? Similar reaction, different? Where were you at, and how did you get to this place now where you've engaged us on this work? Well, basically, it was, um, it actually uh, was a situation where uh, my husband and I both felt like if we did something immediately, it would probably be um, the, the wrong reaction and that there was probably a smarter way to actually help solve this problem. 
um, because the one thing that we felt is that we just we did not want this to happen to another family ever again. And so, um, yeah, we're still both very angry. Um, you know, I still get very emotional, obviously. Um, but we just want to make sure that the next steps that we take are steps that will actually affect change on a bigger scale than something like just jumping to a lawsuit could could accomplish. And so I believe that getting this information out there, having um, having the right people to listen and and um, having the right people want to partner with us to help make changes and make sure that coaches know what are the best practices they should be following, make um, you know options available for for wrestlers, uh, for athletes, and you know have a have a really good partnership and support group for you know like safety net type of situation where it's don't end up falling through the cracks like Avery did. That would be um, our best possible outcome. Great. And and Avery, from your perspective, what what are what your are goals, goals, goals to see what happens on the other end of this? Gone through a really hard experience. What do you what hope happens out of that? Well, what I hope happens is that people is that people can wrestle or do any sport, and that you know people will make sure they have the right coaching and you know the right training, whatever. You know, not just that they can do the sport, but that they, you know, that they can do it well. Excellent. Ken, are you with us? Yeah, and I was actually going to bring the question back around to you, Josh, you know, and ask, what steps do you see NCI taking to try to meet these goals that the Ingram family has? Yeah, so I was really struck when, Teresita, when you and Brandon and uh, brought this story to me. It, for me, it was it really hit home. I, I thought about it. And, I reflected a lot on my own childhood growing up and how important athletics were. And my brother Ken, who's autistic. And I'm sorry, and we're going to mute so we don't get back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and my, my own brother Ken, who wanted to participate in athletics and there was no support system in place. And I, it really hit home in the situation and it kind of made me realize this isn't just a one-off situation. That what we have going on here is a, a story that keeps repeating itself over and over again for those who have various challenges to, to do mainstream athletics. And so what was so appealing about you guys when you came forward was that you weren't just looking to make someone pay or punish for what happened, although that's a natural reason to want to go, go down that path. You saw that there's a more productive way to go about this. And so what we've done and what we've been spending a lot of time doing is assessing what, what are the reasons why this story keeps repeating itself. And in particular, what, what are the best practices and lessons learned and safety nets? How, how can we access an IEP process, individual education plan? What, what is there around the Office of Civil Rights? What are there around the wrestling organizations? Uh, what, what are these things that are in place that, that we are shifting the burden so much to you guys as parents, Brandon and Teresita, to, to look out. And by the time you learn it, you're already done with that athletic opportunity. And so for me, uh, a lot of the, the lesson here is that we need to get way ahead of the game and that there, there is a lot we can do at a national level to include opportunities. And, and, and the other part of this for me is that this isn't just about uh, you know, disabled athletes, but about all of the folks who are teammates and competitors and fans of these incredible athletes and are being denied the opportunity to, to actually experience their athletic career. My my next question was a what's next question. Where where are, are, are we going from here? So at this point, we've done an assessment looking at the the, the laws, the federal laws on the subject, the state laws to the extent they exist, which is not in Oregon. We've looked at uh, the you know the local athletic governing bodies, for example, in the 4J district, which covers uh, Lane County. We've looked at wrestling organizations such as USA Wrestling and its its subsidiary in Oregon, 
and we've looked at nonprofits. And so, from our point of view now, there's a you know we have a we have sort of a strategic plan to try to realize these goals. And I wondered if you wanted to conclude perhaps by speaking a little bit about what what are we going to do next? Sure. So we had some very significant findings. Um, first of all, and I think I think the family found this late in the game, and, and most families would find this late in the game. But there are some protections put in place uh, around civil rights that probably are not being implemented in a very proactive way. So what we're finding are uh, you know, these equal access coordinators that are supposed to be in place for every school system. We can't locate them in, in a sampling of school systems that we've looked at. That's really concerning to know that that safety net isn't functioning the way it is designed and legislated to function. So one clear area is to bring awareness around that. We, we also know that there are some best practices in every sport, and, and we'll use wrestling as the example, around how can you coach and support an athlete with specific disabilities. So here we have a blind wrestler, and there are some really interesting best practices that the family uncovered around you know, using Avery as a dummy during, during lessons and, and being able to experience um, very hands-on coaching. There's also a whole support system around one-on-one -on -one coaches and, and supports that are, it's almost impossible to navigate as a family unless you have some sort of support. So a lot of what we're trying to do is make a call to action for nonprofits and, and trying to identify which the right nonprofit would be uh, to really engage the appropriate safety net that, that is supposed to be in place and then to, to start to share these best practices that we know are available because it, it, the cost of not including people in athletics is significant and it shouldn't be born on the family to try and discover this over and over again. In fact, there are some really good best practices out there and if we try and tackle it only on a local level, we, we don't solve the problem in the way it needs to be solved. So what we're really looking to do is a call to action to, to implement a plan that is based around our assessment. We have a series of things, Ken, that you've been a part of as well and, and I'll let you fill in some of the gaps too about things that we think make a big difference if they were in place and shift the from a burden on the family to try and discover how they can advocate for their son or daughter as an athlete but but really creating a system that that does not fail but actually functions to include people in really meaningful athletic experiences yeah I think what we've we've discovered so far is that there are you know really good federal laws in place that essentially say that you know that mandate equal opportunity that mandate that that school systems create and have a, have an equal access coordinator and that they do, they develop an equal you know an individual education plan that can include extracurricular activities and furthermore the you know the other positive in, is is we like as you mentioned is that we know that there are wrestling you know that the wrestling organizations actually know what best practices are and they're very, you know, and, they're, and it's actually surpri you know, surprisingly simple to implement those practices in a lot of ways. What's missing is the ability to compel the parties to actually engage in those practices. And so in this case, is, uh, sadly, you know, really illustrates that well. Because if, if the coach in this instance had, had you know, been properly educated, if there had been a certification process within wrestling and, and or the athletic director at the university had been aware of the you know of the law on the subject of the of what specifics are required in terms of an you know, in terms of developing extracurricular activities i don't believe this this would have occurred and i think what what's great about what the what, what the ingram family is doing is instead of trying to focus on this on this coach however blameworthy he may be the the real focus should be on the larger picture of how can we change the institutions so that in the future, you know, disabled athletes who are in a position like Avery is, um, are are going to get every opportunity to to display just how good they are in their chosen in their chosen area. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, we don't have a happy ending yet, right? We, what we have right now is an unfinished story. We we have Avery who had the start of a really good experience as a wrestler that shifted to a really kind of troubling experience and, and for the whole family. And it becomes meaningless if it doesn't become a warning signal and a change agent for everything else. And, and in talking with the family, and we've spent some intensive time together, all of us who are on this hangout right now, that this we need to bring meaning to this. We need to 
have this be an important moment where we don't keep repeating this problem over and over again. And and you know when I listen to your story, Teresita, about what it meant to the other wrestlers who were competing against Avery, to me that's incredibly compelling. Uh, it, it's not just about the folks who, who have disabilities themselves, and, and I think that in its own right should be important enough, but that it becomes an experience of really, we're, we're missing out on, on having these great experiences and inspirational moments and, and truly great athletes. We, we, as we were researching, we found stories of blind pole vaulters and, 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 and really phenomenal things happening that are not supported and in place, and, and the fix is so easy if we can just make a call to action. Um, Teresita, Brandon, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity sort of to add to our wrap-up here. So I'm going to start with you, Teresita, and then I'll shift to you, Brandon, and then Avery, if you want to gather your thoughts a little bit, too, about any final statement you want to make to the audience, that would be great as well. So, Teresita. All right. Um, well, you know, basically I believe that having um, Avery on the team was it was really positive for him in a lot of ways it was positive for the teammates in a lot of ways it was definitely a positive experience for everyone that came to watch and that wrestled against him and um, I think that having somebody with different levels of abilities um, as a teammate it, it, it's a teachable moment in itself and it's a, and it's something that um, is really going to stick with everyone for the rest of their lives, and they will always be able to uh, look back and reflect on the time that they spent together and um, and and see how it made them a better person, you know, better athletes and just better all around. So um, I feel it's very important to to make sure that that um, disabled athletes are included and um, and. You know, not we don't want to have him be given special treatment, but we just want to make sure that they're given equal opportunity. Great, thank. You. So I am. Well, I am kind of disappointed. Well, sorry. Okay, let me start. So I am disappointed that I never got to wrestle at districts, but overall, you know, I think it could be for the best. As long as you know, I can turn this into something good. You know, I mean, if I can make sure every disabled person has the same opportunities to wrestle or to do any sport, then you know, I think it would be worth it. And you know, there are some sports that disabled people might not be able to do, but there are some that you know that I could do if I wanted to, if I wanted to. You know, like. There just have to, the right systems just have to be in place. Yeah, I, I think that's incredibly well said, Avery. 